This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, and Eventide. So get ready to rock. Had we made that in a few months, it would have sounded different. We had the opportunity to go in and say, that song's not working. Why is it not working? I, I don't know. And that's a really good answer. If you don't know why it's not working, it's good. That means you can you can reopen old you know, muted channels and say, oh, you know what? Now that has a new, now that's got a whole new life in it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mike Kozowski, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jared Kay, a Southern California-raised, Nashville-based songwriter, producer, and multi-instrumentalist. He's worked with an eclectic slew of artists, including Weezer, Goo Goo Dolls, Kate Nash, Rustin Kelly, Betty Who, The Brummies, Travi McCoy of Gym Class Heroes, and Elohim. He's also toured with various artists such as Zach Waters, Pretty Sisters, Rustin Kelly, and Lucy Silvis. In fact, we met probably, I think, this year at the uh, Hay Bale Bonnaroo studio when he came into my studio rocking out on some electric guitar, playing with Rustin Kelly, which was awesome. And Jared currently owns and operates his own recording studio, Chateau Noir, in East Nashville, where, as I understand it, he is writing and producing some pretty amazing stuff. So please welcome Jared Kay to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jared, are you ready to rock, dude? I'm very ready to rock. Sweet, man. Tell us in your own words more about who you are and, and how you got into recording and stuff. Um, well, I'm from uh, Orange County originally uh, in California, and music was always a hobby. Um, I actually was more focused on the film world before music. Imagine um, that being in, in LA and Orange right, County. Right, of course. Um, and so I was, you know, I was on track, as they say, to uh, go into the treacherous universe of, of filmmaking and all the <laughs> disappointment that, that comes with that. Um, so yeah, I went to, I uh, tried to go to film school and, and I did go to an art school in high school um, that had a, a film program and I just became really obsessed with the editing element of filmmaking. Um, so I did that for, I freelanced as an editor since I was 15 years old. Um, wow. To about 25 years old. 
for about 10 years. And then that turned into um, the creative side started to dip and I became more of like a button pusher. And I hated that element. All the while I was working on music, um, playing in bands and stuff growing up, you know, playing garage bands and um, I don't know, recording things on whatever was available. Like, you know, my first recording rig was probably um, like a Fruity Loops or something like that on my right computer. On, yeah. Or um, there was another one. I can't remember the name. Now, of, of course, it's just FL Studio. Of course. Yes, yeah, because they can't call it Fruity Loops for some reason. It's just not professional enough. Uh, oh, there was one before that was called Audacity, which was really great. you actually made music on Audacity. Yes, that was my first recording software. It was oh Audacity. Yeah, dude, I'm. Do, do you need me to come give you like a, a hug or something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was challenging, but to be honest, it was great because it taught me so much about limitation. You know, it was you really couldn't do that much in Audacity. Um, yeah, my understanding of the limitation of Audacity is. Music plus audacity equals no. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like you can't even record. Like, can you even do an overdub in audacity? Um, not that I recall. No, it was basically just like a, like a stereo recorder. Right. No better than like a field recorder. Right. Um, but there were things you could do. If I remember, I think you could kind of ping pong, maybe sort of like a very rudimentary software, but anyhow, I was really into that stuff. I was really into Audacity. And then, of course, that became Fruity Loops. And then that became, how do I get, um, you know, I think there was a program called, this was before GarageBand or Logic. It was a program called, I'm going to say Soundtrack, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. And it was a, mm -hmm. like a, like a composer's software. Apple made it. I think it came with their, you know, OS and it was basically just loops. So you just like, they just had a bunch of loops and you can mix and match. You do like hip hop beats with classical music. And I just right became on. obsessed with that stuff. I'd come home from school and do that all the while. Like it would be something I would use to kill time if I was waiting for editing notes or whatever. It was just really fun. Um, and that just got me really interested um, in recording music and making music and mixing genre together was like, I just remember very specifically some hip hop beat with some like string arrangement with some like piccolo thing and going, wow, that's, that's so, to me, that felt really fresh. Of, of course that had been being done. I had, you know, I didn't know that samples and like that kind of thing was already like basically the foundation of what so hip hop what, was. When know, was this? Was this like, um, uh, this would have been middle school, you know, yeah, like yeah. This would have been nineties, um, like late nineties, late nineties. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, early yeah, 2000s. yeah. I mean like, you know, Back in and, and um, the Dust Brothers had already exactly. happened, exactly, or, or they're still happening. Yes, but, you know they were absolutely. And I was really, I was really into like mini disc culture at the time. That's right. You know that was that was it. I think it was like a three year window, maybe three year yeah, window. Yeah. My, my buddy here, Brian Carter, was like he was all about the mini disc. Yeah, he would record all his mixes went down to mini disc. Oh yeah, always. And so for me, I mean, I wasn't really doing. You know, of course, I wasn't. I didn't even know what a mix was. But I was really just getting into what that stuff looked like, what it looked like to, um, you know, record because like, because mini disc you couldn't buy a record, you couldn't buy a mini disc record, at least not that I knew of. You all, you had to rip it off of right. some source. Right. So I got a mini disc recorder, and every mini disc I owned was like some kind of trip hop thing or like jungle or drum and bass or something. Got into that for a while, um, and then eventually it just became. Uh, I think through a friend, my friend James, he, he had some old version of, you know, some original version of Pro Tools and he had like an M-Box, like a first generation M-Box. Dude, there it is. Yeah, that's it. I've, I have mine in my garage as well. First gen M-Box up on the shelf behind my it head. It still holds up. It's a great, it's a great piece. Mine, mine's only held up by that piece of orange tape. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, I begged my parents for like Hanukkah one year to get me an M-Box and a uh, condenser microphone. Nice. That was how I, everything started. And so I got, I eventually, I think it took like, a, maybe it took like to the following Hanukkah or something, but I eventually got an M-Box and a, if I remember the the number, the Audio Technica mic. I think it's a thirty thirty eight or something like that. One of those cheap Audio Technica mics. I still use that mic to this day. It is still a fantastic, probably hundred dollar condenser mic that sounds that beats out tons of mics. 
um, that I have that are way more expensive. It is a great mic. So I, I had that and a pair of headphones and started making music and was really fascinated by the process of recording into Pro Tools. That that like trumped everything else. Yeah. I was just so much more excited about that. And, and, and because nothing, of course, when you're starting out, all you want to do is get stuff to sound like things that are properly mixed and on the radio or on records. And it's just impossible. It never just, does, right? You just don't know. So like, I didn't know what reverb was. I didn't know what compression was. I didn't know what EQ was. Um, the one thing I can recall from that time is that I discovered by accident that I wanted to put a delay on an acoustic guitar. I don't know why. It's just something I wanted to do. And I, I can't remember the name of that plugin. It was a stock DigiDesign plugin. It was probably just called Delay or right, or right. Short Delay because right there were like different yeah, levels, right. short like delay, short, medium, medium, long, long, extra long. Right. Yeah. I think it was Short Delay, and I just I knew I wanted a short delay, and somehow I mixed the setting up, and it turned out to be this is like a super nerdy thing, but it turned out to be like on the left side, you know, no delay, and on the right side, like a hundred, um, hundred. Uh, I guess samples yeah. was would be how they would have calculated it. Either samples or milliseconds. I can't remember. And I remember it doing that effect. Like, what's that? This, oh, like the, the, Haas the Haas effect. effect. Yeah, where, where it sounds kind of pan. Yeah, it kind of like makes it sound three-dimensional. And I remember being yeah. like, that's the craziest. That to me was the craziest thing I could have ever discovered on my own. And I to this day, I use it on so many things. I mean, that's how I widen things. That's how, I, you know, of course that's a, technique that a lot of people use right right it's one of those things like when you start out that's what's so exciting i think when you're just starting out and you can discover things by accident and they sometimes for the most part they probably won't come into your world but every once in a while one will stick out as sometimes like, yeah i mean like in it forever it, and i remember being in school and learning about stereo miking techniques and i was like no way you know xy pattern right. and ortf and all this stuff totally and so i went up to St. Louis to go hang out with a friend for a weekend. And all we did was take a pair of 57s and mic things in the basement <laughs> in stereo. Yeah. We'd go up and we'd like tap on, you know, I would just, you know, make the stereo miking, put it to a four, a four track or an eight yeah. track cassette, and then just go like bang on, you know, stuff in Anything the basement. around. And then the other thing that, that I remember discovering sort of like that was like, if you took the a bowl, a metal bowl and put water in it mm -hmm. and you kind of hit it and it goes, oh, whoosh, yeah. whoosh, does all that Great. stuff, trying to mic that up. That's so awesome. But but that whole Haas effect thing. Right. Like I I think I kind of knew about it, but then I rediscovered it, you know, like 10 or more years later. Yeah. And I got re-excited about it. Right. And I just sat down and I was like, and all I wanted to do was play around mixing a track where in, I didn't use the pan knob. I just used the Haas effect Amazing. instead to try So you and just like, kind of like gradually make one side more than the other or and then flip it on the other side or whatever. Yeah. That's, yeah. I love that stuff. It's so, great. It's such a strange effect, especially in headphones. You have to almost pop your ears or something. Right. But right. it's an amazing effect. I mean, I I really like if if there's if someone asks me to make like a like a left right of something that I'm not that I hadn't recorded, we just didn't think to do it. I'll you know, a lot of times I'll do that and separate those out so it's kind of got this little bit of delay and then I can kind of tweak each one separately. I mean, it's no different, I guess, than duplicating the track and nudging one over, but sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, just those little tricks are really helpful, like on hi hats to make those wider or on, yeah. you know, especially for more pop, like more pop stuff. Yeah. Well, I you have, and I've definitely got questions yeah. for you about widening stuff in your productions, but, um, just to break it down for a sec for the rock stars. So essentially what we're talking about is that if you have a single sound and it's mono, and you you could duplicate it and put it on a second track, pan one to the left, pan one to the right, um, or you could put like a stereo delay on it and set up the stereo delay so that w the left side has no delay and mm -hmm. the right side is only delay. Exactly. Right? And then so what what happens is if you shift the the side that's on the right, and of course you could flip flop this if you want to, but you shift the side that's on the right with the delay, you just shift it back a little bit, and it, it really is it's like. Um, definitely less than a hundred milliseconds. Oh it's yeah, like anything more, and you start hearing five the delay. To thirty milliseconds. In yeah. fact, what the Haas effect is that at thirty milliseconds, you you begin to hear a distinct echo. Right. 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 And so under that, you don't hear an echo; you just hear a spatial cue. Yeah. 
So yeah. it would have been samples then probably. I think if, if, if. Well, milliseconds is fine. If you do it like anything right, less if you do than it lower, 30 milliseconds. Right. But yeah. I think if I was in, I will always kind of stuck around the 90 to hundred. It must've been in samples. Something right. Like maybe. That. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was. Um, but as a rule of thumb, that it was, that is a really cool effect. If it's done really tastefully, it can be a really, really cool effect. And so just like to finish that thought too, the sound that, ha that your ears hear first is the one that your brain cues to say, oh, it's on that side because our, because of the space between our ears. Right, right. So like if something was on the left and, it, and, and a voice talked, our left ear would hear it first and then there'd be a little bit of a delay and our right ear would hear it. Of course, there's other factors too, like our head filters the sound of it for the right ear. Yeah. And then you've got the thing around your ears, which is the pinea. And, and that filters as well and gives you all the up, down, and front, back cues. Right. It gets crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's a great tip, man. Thanks for bringing that up. Totally. Again. We need yeah. to do more of that. We need to just like- Just tips. Just quick basic tips. tips you yeah. Know, on oh the yeah, show I'm, here, sure. I'm here for quick tips. Yeah. Um, so- So how'd you, uh, um, so you were making records and music in, in LA mm -hmm. and then you, at some point you came to Nashville. Yeah. So I, I, I worked in LA- I went to move to LA from Orange County to go to college and I was still, you know, working as an editor and working in music and, um, got to a certain point where I'd start making the occasional writing trip to Nashville and kind of fell in love with it. Um, and I decided to kind of get, get sort of get out of the, the intensity of the pop scene into a new community where you could bring a guitar into a writing session and no one would give you a funny look. That was really <laughs> exciting to me. Um, so that happened about four years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, about uh, 2015, uh, late 2015, that that's when I made the jump. That's cool. Um, maybe, maybe break down that, that thought just a little bit, the idea of a quote writing trip. I think for some people that sounds really exotic and like, Ooh, how do I get to do a writing trip? You know? Totally. Um, so a writing trip, it can be, it can be a lot of things, but basically, when someone says they're going on a writing trip, most of the time they're talking about uh, the world of co-writing and they're talking about, um, you know, going to a destination, wherever that is. It could be out of town, it could be an hour out of town. It could be in Europe. It could be just, you know, so, somewhere far away or super close that you're going to kind of get out of your space, get out of your routine and either meet new people and, and write songs with them. And you kind of would break it down by the day. You'd say like, all right, there's six people here and two of us are going to pair up today. And then other two of us are going to pair up tomorrow and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Or it could be a trip where you go with a bunch of people that you do know. And it's just the, the trick is just get out of the environment and everyone's kind of in the same big house or big studio that has a bunch of writing rooms or recording rooms. And you can kind of all just pair up and, and you just write songs. Um, and they can be for whatever they can be for the artists that are in the room. It could be two songwriters who, um, are writing songs to pitch to artists. Uh, it could be, um, a producer and a bunch of writers sitting and trying to craft something for usually that happens more in the pop universe. Um, and yeah. certainly in the Nashville scene now it's happening a lot in the Nashville, like music row scene. Um, I mean, like there's a project coming up, there's a film, there's a yeah, something and people exactly. are working towards it. Exactly. Um, what about like earlier on in, in somebody's songwriting and, and producing career when they're like, Ooh, that sounds like I have to know people and be invited. Um, how would you encourage people to just like break out of the, you know, this, this shell of, I, there's no opportunities for me, you know? Right. Um, I know it's, I know it's very different in Nashville than it is in LA. So or, or anywhere else, just personally. Uh, in the Nashville world, you know, the way that songwriters are breaking into the scene is through writers' rounds and shows, showcases, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, people do people do go to those all the time. Big writers go to those. Publishers are, that's part of their job. They're always there. So if you've got something to say and it's authentic and it's real and you can, you, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be the best singer. Uh, you can be, but if you are a storyteller and you're a songwriter, especially in a town like Nashville, I really think it's just a time thing. I mean, I, I of course you want to meet people, but the idea of going and trying to network is pretty dated. And I think people in Nashville and LA and New York, those kind of music hubs can see through that. Um, and I, I think it's just got to come from a real place. 
So going to writers' rounds and and or you know trying to just get your just submit just submit stuff. Um, if you have a band like I know like Lightning One Hundred, our radio station here, all the time says submit your music, and I've heard so many bands that have just sent their songs in that all of a sudden they're just getting played on the radio. I mean, there are tons of opportunities like that, especially with podcasts and things that are just more available that they, than they ever were. Yeah. It's um, like take a, take a chance and put yourself out there. Yeah. You just got to put yourself out there. And it's really scary at the beginning. I think for ev- for anybody, Yeah, you build it up and you want it so bad. And by, but as soon as it gets there, it's really terrifying. So if you don't jump, it's just it's not going to work. You have to do that. I remember doing my first writer's night. Um, I had already been in bands. I'd played music. I'd been on stages for decades, but yeah. like finally, I don't know, eight years ago or something like that, I got invited by a friend to open up for her on a writer's night, you know, or, sure. or like a thing, you know? Yeah. And I was like, great, I'll do it. You know, I want to break out of my shell here. And I just, my acoustic guitar and um, or some songs I had written, some songs I'd co-written with my band, um, just just having a, just enough, you know, to get up there and do like, I think the first night was like, just, I only had to do like two songs yeah. or three songs. Yeah. But um getting up there and and getting ready for it. And then, and it was one of these things where you're like, it's four people on high stools yeah. and you feel like, you feel like they've got cameras and lights, you know, shining oh, yeah. on you the it's whole It's really time. uncomfortable. It was very bizarre. Yeah. And it was in a holiday and you've, I'm sure of you course. know it. It's yeah. the, the, the continental or something like mm-hmm. that here, you know? Yeah. And so it's like this really kind of, in a lot of ways, it feels like this antithesis vibe to the, to the stuff that got me excited about music. But in terms of like, this doesn't feel like where my band used to play, you know, that kind of feeling. Right. Like uh, the walls aren't all painted black and it doesn't smell like barf, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Much cleaner, but then sort of seedy at the same time. Yeah, but then getting up on the stool and 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 the song comes around to you and I started playing my song. And I just like, I swear to God, like my brain shut down, mm-hmm. everything shut down. I almost went into like some kind of, you know, uh, physical arrest or right, something like that. Right. And, and I just, I sort of came to... It's almost like a passing out while you're playing your own song. Totally. I came to in the second verse and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm playing the first verse again. And I don't even yeah. know where I am in the oh, yeah. song or anything. Yeah. But it was so good to just go through that experience. And yeah. Force you have it, to do you know? it once. And I know so many people have that story of like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I kind of blacked out the whole time. And I, I don't know that I sang the right song even or yeah. whatever. I mean, writer's rounds are really, really, they can be really scary. Some people love them. I'm personally... I have, I've done, I think I did one or two when I first moved to town, just I, because I, you know, I wanted to try it all. I really did. Yeah. And, um, I don't know that I'd do them again personally, just cause it's, I just get really nervous in those situations, but, um, yeah, it, it is an awesome way to share with a bunch of people your music for the, you know, for the first time. It's great. Yeah. Well, I mean, very selfishly, it's like an awesome way to just get through those jitters. Definitely. Yeah, make it, make it so it's not so jittery anymore. Just do like, it once. Yeah, get to do the it once, and then moment. you can do it again. Like exactly. But um, well, that's very cool. So um, that's great advice, man. Thanks for sort of encouraging. Yeah, everybody to do that. Um, so now you've been here, and mm-hmm. um, and you moved here, and you you sort of do know some people, and have been making music with people. Tell us about uh, your studio here in in Nashville, and and um, you know what you like to do since you've been here. I guess been four years or something like that. Yeah. So the first the first two years was really just. I just kind of gave, I just gave up any idea that I was good. I just said, and I still, I think I've given that up, but I basically just said, I don't know anything. I'm in a new place. There's new rules. Just, just be open to any experience. And it doesn't matter if it's something that you want to do, something you don't want to do, just do it all. And so I spent the first two years because I was so fascinated by the music row community of, of, you know, people that are people that are getting into the, stu- into the writer's room every day as a job, five days a week. Right. And they are co-writing songs to pitch to country artists. That is their, that's their job. It's an amazing thing to watch. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a total art form. It's not something that I was very good at, honestly. Um, it's a skill set. It's a it, learned skill set. It absolutely it. is. And there's, and it's not just about writing the song. You've got to have a business mentality to succeed. You've got to be a hustler to really make, you know, to really sell the song outside of it being a song. And so, but I wanted to, I just wanted to know. I figured, all right, give myself a year and a half and just figure it out. Um, and then I quickly discovered that I, 
of course settled back into just doing what I always do. What you're already good at. Yeah, or what I was already, you know, what I was already, what I already liked, basically. Um, And that became, you know, I went on the road with um, a couple artists here in town, Rustin Kelly and Lucy Silvis. I toured with them for three years, um, kind of in parallel. So their tours somehow in three years never overlapped. I don't know how that happened. (laughs) (laughs) That is lucky. It was really lucky. Uh, So I would go out with Rusty and then come home for a couple of days and jump out with Lou and, and just do that back and forth for about three, yeah, almost three years. All the while, um, I was making records and, um, Rustin and I were, were, had started working when I first moved to town on his record, Dying Star, um, which that whole album took about two and a half years to make. Um, so, that was happening while I was touring and I was, there were other records that were happening and I would try to schedule them in these little pockets of time. And it just got so intense. Um, and I was writing with both of them sometimes together, uh, and, and many other friends. And then eventually I just decided I got to come off the road. It's, it's time. Now, were you, did you move here single or did you move here with family? No, just me. Just Just moved here. Yeah. By myself. And um, I had started when I decided to start making the shift to to come off the road, and I had toured for. And when you're touring, you're playing guitar. I was always playing guitar, yeah. sometimes keys, yeah. but mainly guitar, acoustic guitar, or electric guitar. And, and, and singing. just out of curiosity, yeah. how do you feel like the people, the touring and the playing opportunities? How do you feel like those people were aware that you played guitar and that you were that that's what you did? Um, through writing sessions, really. All the, a lot of that stuff came through just a friend of a friend and we'd meet and, you know, be out. It sounds a bit cliche in a way. Like we'd be at a friend's house and some guitar would come out, you right, know, and we'd right. all be and playing songs and, you know, it, that happens no matter how like sort of corny and kitsch that sounds, that happens in every circle always. That always yeah. happens. If musicians are around, they're always playing music. Right. So... I, we have trouble not playing music. Though. Yeah. That's what we love to do. And if you get a bunch of songwriters together, Especially we're going to want to hear groups. each other's songs. Yeah, I always feel more yeah. motivated to want to break an instrument out <laughs> with friends, you know, mm-hmm. play music with people. So I met, I met Rustin in, I met Lucy and Rustin on the same day, just in the lobby of the BMG publishing company, just of the building. That was the company that I would, uh, that publishing company that I'm signed to and the publishing company that they were signed to. And we just all met in the lobby. I mean, Rustin and I didn't even write for at least a year or two. We just met. He just said, you seem lost (laughs) or something. I said, yes. Um, So yeah, the opportunities come in really strange ways. I think you just have to be open to them. Yeah. Yeah. and I know that it can be really frustrating for people who are trying to figure out how do I break in. What what for you was the path towards having a writing deal? You know, from it, it was it was getting together with a friend of mine who was in a band. My friend Zach Waters, who uh, n- now goes by Pretty Sister, but at the time he was go- he was Zach Waters, and he was in a band. And I just called him and I said would you ever want to write together? Nice. And he said, okay. He had never, he wasn't really co-writing that much, but he said, sure. So, and I was just writing with friends. I was just writing music with friends. And so we started writing together and he was sending music around town, around LA to different publishers. And eventually some publisher became interested and he was, he ended up signing a publishing deal and, Every time we wrote together, we tended to have a really good time. So he would then pull me in on other sessions and then I would meet people and then I would call them and then we would have, you know, it just kind of, it just kind of just stemmed starts. out. You start from somewhere. Yeah. You just got to. So, but it's that great tip. Once again, it's like when you're trying to start something, start at, at the nearest destination. Yes. Start with your friends, start with your family. Yeah. Start right near you. You know, if something, wor- if something's going to work, it's going to work and you'll know. Nowadays you can post music on line with ease and, um, you know, get your friends to listen to that, right. which is awesome. Right. But if the music is really good, it will find a way to trickle 
of one, all it takes is one friend to show it to one person and that person to, to late night drunk at a party, put it on and someone go, what's that? And it just ping pongs all the way. And yeah. maybe someone hears it. I mean, yeah. but you just have to do the work and it, you know, it took years for me to enter into the publishing world. And eventually I did. Um, so I just had a vision of a like a yeah. music discovery app where you need where you just swipe left, swipe right, right, know? like a Tinder like, for yeah, like a Tinder for music, right, 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 yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for short spe- short attention span theater. Yeah. I mean that's, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds terrible. That sounds that's good. I mean that's what it is these days, right? Yeah. It's all jingles basically. Yeah. So well, that's cool, man. So yeah. um, tell us about Chateau Noir. What do you? What's your? What does your studio feel like? You know, what, what what are the tools you like to use? That's that kind of stuff. So yeah, I have a studio in East Nashville called Chateau Noir. Um, it opened February of this year, which is 2019. Um, and it was a project that went through various, various iterations and eventually became a studio that's attached to my house that is very similar to a lot of studios in East Nashville. Um, and I just decided that I wanted a really high ceilinged, large live room space with a couple of ISO booths. But mainly I just kind of like to keep all the doors open and keep it one big room. But at least there's a little bit of separation. And then um, a control room that looks into that space with a giant window. So it all feels like one big flow. And um, it's very simple. I'm not a massive gearhead. I, I do I do love gear. I just don't have a lot of it. And I'm mainly in the box for everything when it comes yeah. to mixing and recording. But it's cool listening to your work. It sounds like you got all the right gear, you know, so that's, well, that's always you. encouraging to hear. It's very simple. I mean, for the longest time up until this year, I just didn't care enough about mic choices and preamp choices and compressor choices and things like that. It just wasn't something that got me going. You know, I liked it when I had it at my fingertips, but because I didn't have it at my fingertips, you just what you I just used what I had. Yeah. And you just figure out a way to make it work. I mean, I've made records yeah. before on one mic the whole time. Everything was recorded on one mic. What um, mic was that? On an 87, on, an, on a nice. U8, Neumann U87. Those are good mics. Which is a great mic and... Of course, with a mic like that, you certainly can make things. You can make an entire record on that mic, yeah, yeah, certainly. Totally. But, you know, before that, I was making entire records on my Audio Technica, whatever that. Was it 4033 or something like that? 4033 right. or 4038 or, yeah. I, I have a 4033. That was sort of maybe like. Maybe it's that one. That was kind of a ma- little ma- medium diaphragm magic bullet mic that was it was around and popular and then they stopped making it. Yeah, they don't make it anymore, I don't think. It's like an early, it's gray. I know there's a black one as mm-hmm. well. I have the black one. Okay, Mine's so I have like the, the gr- special edition. Right. So I have the gray one, which is, I. Th- it's, it must have been early 2000s or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it has a 10, D, 10 dB pad that's on That's exactly. It and, and a low, low cut. cut. Yep. That's right. Yeah, so that's the mic. And a, um, a little shock mount thing with a rubber band that falls apart all the damn time. Yeah, so mine's broken and I just used but you know what electrical I did? tape. You can try it, man. I emailed Audio Technica. And they sent me out a replacement rubber You're band kidding. and system for it. They were like, oh, here you go. No problem. Oh, I got to do that. They totally support their mics. Oh, amazing. Oh, That's yeah. Cool. I, I fully support their mics. I think that they're an awesome company. Recording Studio Rockstars Academy is the place you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro-sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything else. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, well, very cool. So, um, you know, somebody else who's been on the show, um, Kyle Andrews, um, who's another fantastic writer and producer. I think you guys would probably totally get along. Um, he talked about that kind of like, you know, just using the one mic that you've got and stuff. And you get real creative with these tools. Right. But um, talk more about that. Like, 
How are some, what were some of the things that you remember discovering where you could be the Haas effect? Like right. that's a great way to get creative just in the computer. Yeah. What are some other things that like were like real light bulb moments for you? Um, ambience was big for me, especially in when I was working in LA and I was doing pop sessions a lot. I was trying to find a way to make my, um, make my, my productions feel like they weren't made in a computer, but, but there's, there is, of course, there is something really amazing about like an electronic soft synth. It, nothing really sounds yeah. like that. Yeah. Not even an analog synth can sound like a soft synth. It's just so computer, you know, it's just all ones and zeros. So yeah. I really, very, and I really, pure. it's very pure tone. And I really like, I actually really like that sound. Um, I'm a sucker for like that Skrillex, like the, those uh, the Zed, like I, I'm no shame. I am a Dude, total sucker too. for that stuff. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit that one of my favorite shows I ever saw at Bonnaroo was Skrillex. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, the dude knows what he's doing. Absolutely. Uh, you, know, you know what it is about the, all the soft synth stuff? Yeah. It makes your speakers sound really good. It totally does. It does. And so that was something that I was really fascinated by. And there was like a little movement of, of music happening back in um, the late 2000s. Uh, uh, call, like, it was called like Fidget House. We were all calling it Fidget House, which was basically like chopped samples of, of things. And, and everyone had different methods to do it. Um, there was this, there's a, this is amazing uh, French DJ uh, named Madian who, um, that's, I think that's how I heard about it in the first place was because he had done this thing where he'd play a bunch of the same lines on different sounds and then chop them up so that like just a fraction of a second of one would be played on one, but then it would go to the next sound and continue that lead line. So it would just jump around like, so that kind of you're thing. hearing the melody, but the sound that is playing the melody is changing. It's changing. It's more exactly. It'd be like you playing a, it's more than meets the ear. Absolutely. It'd be like you playing a guitar, a guitar solo, and you're just literally just choosing between pedals. You're just we did stomping that. pedals all the time. We did that on the Nielsen Hubbard record. Oh, right? amazing. Uh, yeah. Slide Project. It was one of the first ones I got to <laughs> hear. Yeah. But I forgot all about this, but uh, um, we did that where like we had a guitar solo. Yeah. And he played the solo with a whole bunch of different guitar sounds on right. different tracks. And then I took a, bu a piece of paper and I wrote down all these little things and we shook them up in a hat Yeah, and everybody had to pick them out. And that <laughs> told me what the arrangement was. And we changed the guitar. We just comp from track to track, like every 16th or eighth note through the whole solo. So, like, that's what, that's what I it is. I had no idea we were doing you were fidget doing it house. Fidget, that, like sort back. of a fidget house. or I, I don't know. That's just what my friends and I would call it. That's but, great, man. I but, love it. Um, that kind of stuff. I was really into that stuff. It was just, I'm really, I get really, I'm really attracted by like music that is something that feels otherworldly like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know that there's, you know, there, there are production and songwriter purists out there that would, that would say like, Oh, it just made in the computer. So it, it's not valid or whatever, but I, I celebrate it fully as much as I'd celebrate anything else really. Um, and so I was looking for a way back to the, the production tip or the, the quick tip, I was looking for a way to do something like that, but try to mix in some sort of space, like a, like a room yeah. and nothing was working. It, like every time I'd try to put like a room verb on something, you don't get the tightness. You don't, that's the whole point. The right. point is that it's quantized and that it's tight and that there are no, when the reverb ends, when, when, when the line ends, the reverb cuts off right, right. at zero right. and it's really pleasing. And so I was experimenting with how do I make something that feels as good, um, but is also fun and you can kind of, cause I love, I, I'm really obsessed with like subliminal messages. <laughs> um, and so I discovered Wait, are that, you giving me any subliminal messages? I mean, right you now? just, you haven't been like, no, I wouldn't you, know, right? You haven't been, no, they're, cause they're subliminal. Um, I don't know why I was, I've always been obsessed with subliminal messages. And so again, looking for a way to make it feel like they're like, it's in a space, like it's, you know, quote unquote organic without it being, without it ruining the sound. Dude, and I, that's pretty cool because that these are, these have a lot to do with the questions. I right. Wrote down okay, cool. Productions. Yeah. So my, my solution was to, again, play with ambient space. I put a microphone on one side of the room. I went to the other side of the room and 
the people that were in the session that day, the writers I was writing with, I have this box of toys that were just to- super random, not even like percussion, just random toys that made sounds. And the first time it happened, I just said, okay, everyone just go and kind of hit stuff, you know, just kind of, it can be on beat. It can be off beat. It doesn't matter. But just on the other side of the room. So you just, you kind of hear the room and I'm not going to simulate any reverb. It's just going to be what it is. It's really bizarre, short room sound. And then what I would do is I'd just, I'd loop the song and I'd let it go like four or five times and I'd group it all together, which just sounded like mush. It just sounded like absolute mush. And then I'd quantize those sounds in, in logic, like if with flex time, or you could do it with beat detective and pro tools or whatever. I'd quantize those sounds as a group. So I'd group them all together and quantize them. So the beat just kind of chaotic and then I'd gate them. And then you'd hear this, you'd hear just these sort of ambient sounds that would go along with the fidget house things that would make it just sound like it was the sounds were were triggering in a room, but they would still be short, if that makes sense. They I think so, yeah. They would still trap. They they wouldn't yeah, it the would, gates are great for that. Gates too. are great, yeah. but you can gates are awesome if you have a sound that you wanna, you know, if you wanna shorten a sound and you don't want any trail, you can use a gate, but I, I liked just a bit of it. I just like just a tiny bit of it. And then it would kind of hard chop. So it would be this kind of this found sound thing that would play kind of random, but it would sometimes line up and I just like cut out a little piece. Okay. That works. Right. I fly that around to the choruses. I really like that. And that, oh, that's a cool thing. Oh, that could be a transition on a verse. That's my, now that's the transition. I don't need a drum fill or a sweep or anything. That's it. That's so it. those types of things are really fun. If you're just messing around um you can incorporate you can merge styles i love merging genres like that that's cool yeah well that's pretty exciting so um do you allow yourself a certain amount of time in your studio or or do you consider your writing time where you're experimenting and experimenting with sounds i try to It, it just depends on the it depends on the duration of the record um with something like dying star with rustin's record we had two and a half years to make it. I mean, that. so it was, we could always go back. It's sort of funny that it took two and a half years and it was called Dying Star. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it was a really difficult process. And, 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 you know, had we made that in, I don't know, a few months, it would have sounded different. Right. We had the opportunity to go in and say, that song's not working. Why is it not working? I, I don't know. And that's a really good answer. If you don't know why it's not working, it's good. That means you can, you, I love muting stuff. I, one of my favorite things in the world to do is if something is not working or if someone goes, I don't know why it's just not feeling right. Usually I mute everything but the vocal. And then we just listen to the vocal and we just go, what are we hearing? What right. is wrong with this? If the vocal is working, then we know at least the song is good. Yeah. And then we just we just adjust and tweak and then, you can reopen old, old, you know, muted channels and say, oh, you know what? Now that has a new, now that's got a whole new life in it. Right. Um, so I do like experimenting both with recording and um, like in the box experimentation too. Well, cool, man. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how you like to uh, work with an artist, for example. So, I mean, maybe, maybe you've already explained it by talking about your writing process, but um, when do you feel like you're the writer, the engineer, the mixer, the producer? When the song begins, I try to not touch the computer. In fact, uh, these days I, I won't even be in the same room. These days, if I have people over at the, over at the studio writing, I'll go into the live room and we'll sit there cause there's instruments around and it's kind of echoey. It sounds just sounds a little bit otherworldly and, yeah. and that can inspire something. And so that's when I feel like if, if I'm, if I'm starting something from scratch, um, I won't think about production and I won't think about mixing. I won't so think that about would be you as a writer. That'd be me as a writer. Yeah. Um, if someone brings a song well, in, Oh what yeah. Tools do you like to, how do you capture that writing idea? If you don't want to touch the computer, um, on my phone, I just write, phone, just I mean, like it's really, I think, yeah. So I use notepad and, uh, voice notes and, um, 
I just, you know, I'll write lyrics there. It always looks like I'm texting, but I'm, it's always just writing lyrics. <laughs> You got any um, tips for the rock stars specifically at like geekery around like, oh, by the way, when you use the voice memo app, here's something to watch out for, or here's a good way to keep it organized or any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's really, di- those are, those are really great apps. And I think most, I would say most people, no matter how big or small, you know, c- career wise are using voice notes and notepad. It's yeah. just, it's just there and it's really easy to use. There is no rhyme or reason. If you're a really organized person, you can go in and and title everything. You can rename your files and voice notes and notepad. You could put headlines so you can go through it. I'm not that organized. So I kind of like the chaos of discovering yeah. a song idea that I recorded when I jumped out of the shower and like ran to my phone to record a quick melody. And it's been two years. Every once in a while, I just sift, I just go kind of random. I just swipe down and find something that just has a date. I go, I don't know what this is. And I listen to, oh yeah, I love that. that that's really cool. Or like, yeah. oh my gosh, that's embarrassing. I love doing that in the that. car on the long trips. So exactly. Like, hear through all this stuff. And then, yeah. and then after you hear some stuff and it's the fifth trip you've heard it on you and you've told yourself it's good. You're like, I'm yeah. like, man, I really got to actually do something about that song. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, I will say that when it comes to voice notes, it can be, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because if, some people have the philosophy of philosophy, philosophy of philosophy is cool. Philosophy uh, is some TV philosophy, show from yeah, it's like a, it's like a the 90s chick dressed up in like, you know, arm, <laughs> armor, sexy armor. <laughs> um, philosophy is great. Um, the philosophy of record everything. A lot of people do that in, in the writing room. They'll come in and they'll either open their laptop or their iPad or their iPhone and they'll just hit record and record for a couple hours. Um, that way, any idea that, any idea that you think was lost, you can always go back. I tend to think of it in a bit of a different way. I, I kind of think it, it's good to record things. If you don't record it and you don't remember it, yeah, it's probably not worth remembering. Mm. And if it comes back around, then maybe it was. Yeah. But if you're trying to write music in any genre, really the, I, hopefully the goal is to make someone feel something. And if they're going to feel something, you want them to kind of remember the song. So it doesn't have to be the hookiest, catchiest thing ever, but if it's memorable, you should remember it. If it came from your own brain, you should remember it a minute later. Yeah. <laughs> so. I remember hearing Jack White talk about that once where he talked about, um, not, he didn't really record the songs because he thought it was, if it was a good enough song, he'd remember it and keep working on there it. There you go. Yeah, totally. Um, I and, agree. And maybe, Part of that thinking too comes from having a real process and commitment. So like, you know, you'll actually be in the studio recording some song that you do remember tomorrow or whatever. Yeah. Whereas sometimes like, if you're like, if you're really um, longing to be writing more songs, maybe, maybe you really do forget if you're going to have to wait till next week before you right. pick up a guitar again. Right. But I know what you mean. I mean, I will I will just, if I have a jam session with somebody, I'll just put the phone on record and record the whole thing. Yeah. And I enjoy going back and listening through some of them. Some of them are real good. Some of them not so good. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. For the most part, I don't really like them. But then every once in a while, a little thing will pop out and you yeah. go, oh, You're okay. Like, oh, I that, remember that why I like music again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool, man. So, um, any, uh, is there, are there any tricks for getting your phone into record real quickly? Is it, um, can you do like, Hey Siri, take a voice note? I think you can. Oh, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't do it, it, it on my phone, but good. Cause your phone's probably off. Like yeah, it is to... actually turned off, but there are, I use, you know, how you double, double tap the, the home button and all your things fan out. Oh, right. And then there's a, so I've got, usually I just close everything and then all I have is notepad and voice notes open. So I hit record, double click, swipe over and go to my notepad so I can see the lyrics Yeah, and uh, it'll record in the background, which is great. There's also an amazing app that uh, is sort of, I, I, I don't know who knows about it. Maybe a million people, maybe millions of people know about it. It's called Spire. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know about Spire? Yeah, I just emailed Isotope. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to be checking that out soon. I so really Spire is one of my absolute favorite apps. Um, and it's a multi-track. It's basically a voice note, but it's multi-track. And it's amazing. And you can actually control the input, which is awesome. You can control the input of your mic. So if you want to record drums on your phone, if you're making a just a demo, you wrote a song in a session and maybe you're not at a studio, maybe you don't have a recording setup, 
but all you have is your phone, you can still make a multi-track recording. You can edit, you can mix in there. There's this really cool sort of spatial mixer thing. I have done countless recordings on this thing. Um, I think it gives you, I think it gives you eight tracks total, which is awesome. And I, if they ever hear this, I'd love 16, but <laughs> they, but it's awesome. It, it's, it's also great. The limitation is awesome. You can do vocal doubles so or good, harmonies. And then, you know, I've done drums where I'll put the phone like on a music stand next to the hi-hat and somehow it just gets a great drum sound, um, especially in headphones. I just put on headphones and it records great. And there's, there's tempo and all that stuff. I don't know why I'm doing an ad for Spire, but Sorry, it's Spire cool, is amazing. If uh, when you're done writing a song and you want to just see how it would start to shape up or arrange it, just get this free app. It's awesome. And you, I think there's hardware that you can buy. Yeah. They have this, this little round thing that's battery right. powered. You can set it down and cool. Um, I'm intrigued by it. I haven't used it yet. So yeah. by the time this episode comes, comes out, I may have, probably already used it. Oh, amazing. Cool. But, uh, but it, I'm intrigued by anything that makes it so, um, when you're in a studio and my studio, like you described your studio, it's got a control room. It's mm-hmm. got a, it's got instruments out there. There's separation of, of responsibilities if you're engineering or playing, you know, and stuff like that. And it, it, um, it sort of like compartmentalizes the making of music and, and recording. Right. And when you want to write, you're like, I just want to, create ideas really quickly and have fun with this. Yeah. And I don't want to, I want to, I want to have the idea in my head for the part. And I don't want to lose that because now I'm thinking about some technology right over here on the side. Definitely. Right? Yeah. I mean, I sit in my studio, which has basically anything you'd ever need to, as does yours to, to make any record that you need to make. Um, and I sit in there on Spire all the time <laughs> on my phone. That's great. And walk around to, the piano, I put my phone on the piano and I record it. It just sounds different. It, you know, um, and yeah, I love, I absolutely love the sound of that app. I think it's great. I, I love um, the compression that, that the natural compression of the, of the iPhone is. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I like the, the iPhone. I use that in too. recordings a lot. You know, I, I'll, I'll use like flip cam, my, like a, my, my old flip camera. Um, there's just something that it does. It's just this tiny kind of crappy microphone that is overly compressed but if I put it, if I sit it, ne- you know, in the drum room and I'm just thrashing away and I just take that and import the file and line it up, it's like the best trash mic ever. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. There's so much low end and so much punch to it. It's just something that I would love to find a, uh, like a mic maker to try to get me like a, a mic version of Dude, it. Dude, let's just quit this interview and go rock out right now. I'm so down. <laughs> let's do it. Um, actually, we'll take a break now for a second. Sure. We'll come back in. Um, Rockstars, in the show notes, scroll down below. I've got a YouTube playlist of Jared's uh, music that he's making. It's killer. We're just about to talk about it in the second half of the interview, and we'll see you guys in just a moment. If you're on the website, just go to rsrockstars.com. Jared K., if you're on your mobile device, again, just scroll down in, in this show notes. You can click right through right there. We'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Cheers. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave Pinsel and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. 
Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish there was an easy solution right now? Whisperoom ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisperoom has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Jared Kay, joining us here in East Nashville at the Toy Box Studio. However, his studio is close by Chateau Noir, also in East Nashville, uh, making cool records. We're going to talk about some of these records you've made. You ready to ready to jam, dude? Let's do the deep dive. Let's do the deep dive. <laughs> All right, sweet. So, um, you know, uh, you, one of your credits on there was, was working with Weezer. What, right. Tell us the story behind that. What was that all about? So that was a song that came from a song called King of the World that came out on a Weezer's White Album um, a few years ago. And that was a song that came out of me, you know, sitting cross-legged in my bed, just like, just like we all used to do, and just writing a little lick, um, not for Weezer, just writing to, to write. And... I had been friendly with this guy, Evan, who is their manager and and had recently become their manager, who came over to the house one day, kind of, I don't know, uh, like the next day after I had written this little thing. And he was saying, um, do you have any music you can play me for any of my artists? And I was thinking about it. I'm going, the artists on your roster are like Weezer and... Goo Goo Dolls and, or maybe not Goo Goo Dolls at that point. No, it wasn't Goo Goo Dolls. Um, like Fall Out Boy, you know, just kind of bands. And I was thinking like, these bands aren't cutting outside songs. There's no chance. But I said, oh, I don't know. I, maybe, <laughs> but I don't think so. It's just not the type of, that's not the type of music that I'm recording. And if it is, it's with the artist. So they're yeah. cut on the records. But I just played him this little idea. Um, I had a different name at, but it was just this, basically this music. You weren't bed. called Jared. <laughs> I was called Jared, but the song had a different name. The song was called something else. I can't remember now. You used to be called Darage. I used to be called Darage. Yes, exactly. And um, I played it for him and he said, I really like this. I, I want to send this to Rivers. And I said, oh, okay, <laughs> sure. And the next day he just like texted me, like, Rivers loves it. He wants to kind of do his thing on it, like he does. And I was like, what? Okay. And um, awesome. yeah, so it was this kind of song that, you know, I had done music to and um, I had written some things to it. And then Rivers came in and as he does, and he's such a music aficionado, he came into the process and reworked it so that it could work as a Weezer song. 
And then they went in with uh, Jake Sinclair, who produced that record, who did an amazing job. And um, yeah, so I, I, the only things that I have on that on that song that are that remain from my original demo are the sound effects. Like I said, I always use sound effects and stuff, like really yeah. subtle. So I think there's like a crowd of the sound effects don't really even line up to his lyric because they lined up to my lyric which he tweaked. So like there was like a, a group of kids like in a schoolyard that kind of bursts that doesn't have any relevance, but is still in there and still I think in like, the final production, still in the final production, like an atomic bomb sound that, that triggered on some word. And yeah, those kind of things kind of make, kind of found their way in there. But, um, that was a real honor for me. I was still to this day, you know, grew up listening to Weezer and one of my first concerts I ever went to by myself as a kid was a Weezer concert at Irvine Meadows amphitheater in orange County. And, it was amazing to get a chance to have a song be a part of their canon. It's it's was really really cool. Well, that's a trip. So you know, thinking about a, a band like Weezer um, or the other bands you listed, mm -hmm. and you think about them, you're like, well, they're bands. They write their own music. They don't, you know. Right. But the truth is, I think as as a professional mu artist, you know, and writer and and musician and artist, you probably you are writing tons of stuff all the time, but you probably also like you don't always have a whole bunch of the best choices or your favorite stuff for your next album. And maybe it is really just a wonderful opportunity to be able to pick and choose from some other cool songs. You're like, great. Like, oh, yeah. I've got my three songs over here, which are great. And this one over here would make a great fourth. Now we got four songs. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe that makes tons of sense. It totally does. And there's nothing, there is nothing wrong with, listening to a song that you really like and deciding to do a version of it. Um, you mentioned Jack White earlier in the yeah. interview, and I don't remember where this quote comes from, and I'm going to probably butcher it, but it might. I just remember Jack White at some point in some interview or a documentary or something saying that he likes to write songs and then cover them. And he, and he says that that's how he Ooh. makes his records. He writes the songs. And then he just covers the songs. And I, I again, I, I hope I'm not botching this too much, but I always loved that philosophy. That's that's great. It's great because it frees you up, which means you know, it doesn't really matter who wrote the song. If it's a song that connects with you, cover it and make it your own. If you need to tweak something, go in and tweak something. And just, that'll, you know, that'll be our inspirational quote for the podcast. There right you go. There. Um, you know, what's funny is I have been suggesting something like that when I've been um, producing spoken word stuff. Cool. So it's one of the one of the gigs I do is I go into high schools around Nashville and I work with kids who have who have written their poems. Right. And they bring them, you know, I'll bring a portable studio in. Now they're in front of a mic and they're reading it for me and I'm trying to like get them out of their skin. Um that sounds weird. Get them out <laughs> of their shell. Uh, you know, to do more than just sound like you're just blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah, off the page, yeah. you know, and get them to like come to life with it. But one of the thoughts I had was like, look, just imagine that somebody else wrote this and they handed you a script and you're just acting it out now. Like That's it. That's and, the secret. And I, and I just coached somebody else on that. But it's so cool to hear you say that idea in music. It makes perfect sense. It's Absolutely. Because like, especially if you wrote your own song, right? It could feel also very... You could feel timid and shy about it and like, can I really say this? And all like, or really like, precious about it. Yeah, right. Where you, you you aren't free, you're not freed up enough to experiment and mess it up. And I think that's something that I really like about um, that theory uh, of like cover your songs. Or, you know, like Wilco in that great Wilco documentary, um, I'm Trying to Break Your Heart. They, yeah. they talk about that a lot in that documentary. They talk about how really they were just writing these little twee folk songs. And then how do we mess them up? I'm going to go and add a bunch of noise on top of them and change the arrangement. Yeah. And do that thing and make it sound, just make it sound fresh, make it sound like something new because yeah. we can all, you know, all day long, just do guitar vocals. But cause that's a lot of times how songs get generated. It's like for the most part, songs are getting written on the guitar or they're getting written on the piano in the traditional sense, in the pop world, they're getting written to tracks um, that producers will kind of build like music beds. And then, and, and all these things ultimately are just easy tools to accompany yourself while you compose a song and yeah. sing some lyrics and get inspired by something, you know, writers get inspired by the weirdest things, you know, try, if you sit down and decide to be a writer 
just decide that that's going to be what your career is as a songwriter. At a certain point, I mean, you do that for five, 10 years, you're going to start going like, am I just rewriting the same songs right. that I was writing back then? How many melodies could I possibly have in me? How many, how how many, many versions of this A, C, D, G chord How many chord progressions? How many lyrics are going to feel fresh? And at a certain point, you need to start finding little tricks to mess with your head and go, okay, I'm, right now I'm going to start, I'm going to write to this prompt or I'm going to write to this thing or, uh, and, and maybe, maybe some people don't have that issue. I know I do. I know I use like, a weird technique. This is a really strange one, but I use, I call it objects in the room where if I'm trying to find a melody that doesn't feel tired and trying to find a cadence, I'll literally look at objects in the room. I'll go like, okay, I know in your studio, you've got three can lights right there and there's a lot of space between them. I'll use that as a jumping off point. I'll go, okay, so I know I want three notes that hold like that. And then you've got a bunch of books. So that's like a bunch of little notes and I'll just start from a weird place like that. I don't know. It, it, it cool. can That's come cool. from anywhere. Well, it's kind of like um, uh, the idea of uh, the, of um, what is it? The the oblique strategy, strategies. oblique strategies, the cards. cards, cards yeah. You know, some some kind of cue. Exactly. I've been practicing something called object writing. I'm not always good about it. I didn't do it this morning. <laughs> right. Of course, <laughs> it's like these just, techniques we love, but yeah. it's hard to stay religious about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Instead, I got up and sent some emails. I had to do it. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Drink some coffee. But um, I'm thinking of Beyonce, um, and I'm hoping I'm butcher the title of the song, but is it like Put a Ring on It or whatever? Uh, uh, I think it, the song is called Single Ladies. Single Ladies. But yeah, thank yes, you, thank that you, thank is you. the- That one. That would be the parenthesis if, if it had one, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So Single Ladies. Thank you, rock stars. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> That track always blew my mind because you've got this this melody, you've got the vocals going on, mm-hmm. and then you and then you listen underneath for the chord progression, and it's like it's kind of not there. No, it's all. And then they the drop place. in this chorus where it's like they just said "fuck you." Mm-hmm. We're deconstructing this entire song right yeah. underneath you, mm-hmm. and I, I was always blown away by that. So I feel like that to me is a really good example of what you're talking about too. Absolutely, and that is very much. I mean, I don't know much about the generation of single ladies. I wish I did. But I know that that is very much a Beyonce thing. Is it's, that like Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, generation of single ladies? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> single ladies, Gen. Gen SL. Gen B, basically. Gen, Gen B. B. But I know that her process is very much deconstruction. It's very much like, we we'll get a song, and it's really simple. And then, but that's not really working. So let's get someone else to come in and reproduce the track, but then we might keep this from that. And then we might, uh, you know, tweak the chord progression, shift everything to the left. I know how she's so involved in her, in her process and so hands on with all that stuff and is really particular about things. And that's, I think that's the only way you can get, of course, the producers of that track, whoever did that, and I don't know off the top of my head, were, I mean, that's- Was that, that is, one that Jay-Z was involved in or something like that? I, I really know. I really can't remember on that this song. Is wrong. We're just going to sound like a bunch of dummies now. Yeah, we have no idea. I'm like, we're I don't know. We're embarrassing some of was, our listeners who really yeah. know the answers to and this. Someone's <laughs> shouting at the, you know, to the, you know, out, shouting in their car right now. Yeah. Oh, hey, Broxer. So once again, I encourage you, drop a comment in below. Yeah, uh, prove if you, us if you're wrong you're listening right on now. YouTube, drop a comment in right there and, and uh, give us the answer. And- <laughs> I'm trying to to get us all to do this more now. Um, type in the time. Look at glance at the time of where you are in the podcast. Type the time in. You just put like minute colon, or no, you put like hour colon minutes. It's probably minutes at this point. Um, but uh, but you put that and then your comment and that that adds an automatic YouTube time timestamp. There you go. Uh, so yeah, somebody jump in here. Uh, but yeah, that it is it's brilliant. The the track is unbelievable, but it doesn't line up at all to the top line at all. And that's I think what makes it so special. Well, so let's talk a little bit about um, how you like to do that kind of deconstructing some more when you're producing and hitting the studio. Um, you know, I don't know which of the artists you want to talk about. You've done amazing stuff with Kate Nash, uh, Pretty Sister. Sounds amazing. I want to talk about that for sure. Um, Elohim. Any of these songs uh, involve kind of a deconstructive process for you? Um, absolutely. I'd say all all of those artists, there, there, there is always deconstruction. There's always, you know, the initial idea. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Well, somebody um, comes to you and they've got right. like... And it's, you know, it's coming from the iPhone and it's mm-hmm. just acoustic guitar and yeah. vocal. 
and it sounds like same old, same old. Right. You know it's a good song, but it's same old, same old. What's a first move for you? We're like, how do I, I need to erase the same old, same old from my brain mm -hmm. and rethink this song. It's going to start with the focus of the song. So if the focus of the song, if, if the song is supposed to be a story song and the vocal is, is paramount, it's going to start with the vocal. It's going to, I'm going to say, if we're, if we're starting recording that day, I'm going to say, get in there and let's lay down a guitar or a piano or some kind of just some kind of chord bass and we'll cut the vocal just could be a scratch vocal. Just get it out with energy and then I'll mute it. And then we just listen to the acapella. For me, that's where I always like to start unless ideas are instantly flowing in, which sometimes they do, but sometimes you don't know it's a blank canvas. You don't know what the song is going to be. So if, if the song is supposed to be more, um, like drum heavy as, and, and it's really just supposed to be a mood and the vocal is cool, but really the production is key. Um, then start there. Then I'll start with just focusing on what the drums should do and yeah. the rhythm of that. And a lot of times that means a lot of things fast. If I'm doing pop stuff, um, for the most part, I'll switch back to logic from pro tools because okay. their MIDI capabilities are so much cleaner and so much easier for me. Yeah. And I've just spent so many years like building my sample libraries and building my favorites and my soft sense and things like that, that I know exactly where to go. And pro tools, it's, it's so much, uh, it's so much more challenging for me to do any kind of programming. So yeah. pro tools is always going to be hand chopping. I'll drag and drag and drop method. Yeah. I always think about, um, logic is a, a place for composition and Pro Tools is a place to, you know, sort of professionally now record stuff. You Absolutely. Know, when you, when you, it's time to plug mics in. Yeah. I tend to do Pro Tools, but I also have all my experience in Pro Tools, not in Logic. Right. So I get I excited started about Logic. And, yeah, went to Logic. But I don't know how to back. edit in Logic. I don't know how right. to do stuff. So yeah, though I love both of those. I love both of those DAWs so much. And now I, it depends on the, it depends on the session, but now I have both open at the same time. So I'll have logic on one monitor and Pro Tools on the other, and I'll route out of my two computers or one, one computer, which is, it's just like killing my CPU, but right. it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's what CPU is there for. That's what it's there for. And I, by the way, I, I, I still, thought we were deconstructing songs, but you're deconstructing are, your CPU um, yeah, too. Right? Yeah. And by the way, I, I still run everything off of an old 2013 laptop. Nice, Everything. dude. Yeah. We're, my studio computer is 2009. There you go. I, I, and I used to have that 2009 cheese grater, which is a great a great machine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everything is just run off of this little i7, you know, 2013 but you, but laptop. But you plug that into a couple of bigger screens to work. Yeah, it's all fanned out with one of those, like, you know, OWC uh, uh, docks, oh, yeah. Thunderbolt oh, yeah. docks. We know OWC very well. Oh, I love OWC. Great. Yeah. Um, and so anyhow, so I'll have logic open on one and I will just route the output, just the stereo out of logic out through my patch bay and then pop it into a preamp or, or compressors or whatever, however I want something to sound. Uh, and, and then I'll just open up a live, um, feed into a Pro live Tools. feed into Pro Tools. Let's, let's pause right there. Sure. So, so that's a really good tip. Let's, I want to, I want to uh, emphasize the value of that tip right there. Oftentimes, I think rock stars we we think about like ooh Logic and Pro Tools. Oh, how do they how do they sync up and mm -hmm. how how do we have the per, a digital feed and is it some kind of plug in and ah these aren't working and ah now my head hurts. When if you just have two interfaces like that, it's so simple to just go. I'm just going to go out of this interface and into this one. Forget worrying about whether it's you know digital the digital transfer is maybe better than the analog transfer any of that crap. Plus, it gave you the opportunity to treat it like it was an actual synthesizer outside in the yeah. studio that you're now using to send songs over. Mm -hmm. um, so you can really like come up with cool sounds. Definitely. And I use these days. I'm using Logic as an instrument. That's all. That's really what it is. And I'll program in there, you know, uh, on the occasion. But now will they stay in sync with each other so that you uh, know, no, I'll, I'll, right? no, I'll, I'll never hit play in Logic. It'll, I'll just, I'll just run it as if it was. Um, as if it was like Ableton Live or or what's the Logic version of that um, um, that people use? I can't remember. I don't even know. Now, I'm, I'm gonna not not say it right off. It's the top like of my people head, use it for live. Um, you know, they set up their soft synths and so I, yeah, I, I'm blanking yeah. on the name. 
Um, Proc source. There you go. Drop another there you comment. Go. Yeah, drop another Tab comment. Stamp it. Give us the answer. Oh, I can't. I remember. Anyhow, it's just that. It's. I'm sure there are, there are a million ways to do this. That's just a way that I found that works for me, especially if I go to another studio. Now, how do you avoid the latency, the MIDI latency troubles of you're playing your keyboard and it's like, can uh, you play drum beats that way or is it more yeah. for pads and things? I play all that, every, anything. I and need the keyboard to play. still triggers the, the, uh, the Logic okay? Yeah, so I just make sure there's nothing on my master bus in Logic. Mm-hmm. And in Pro Tools, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly, I have my, my, my two bus in Pro Tools, I'll just deactivate it. You know, if I'm like, right. if I'm doing that kind of, you mean so the Pro Tools is um, adding latency through the plugins yeah. on the Master Bus, and I'll example. just take yeah. it as low as I can to, yeah. you know, as low sample. How as, low can you? How go? low can you go? <laughs> and then I turn on low latency monitoring and Logic, which unfortunately in Pro Tools doesn't do the same thing. In Pro mm. Tools low latency mode, it does something different where your speakers turn off, and you have, and I think it's basically to use like more outboard. So to go do like signal direct bypass the processor. I don't know how that works. And then you're ready for like, send me to lunch. Mode. And then I'm just like, I just don't know. But logic has an amazing low latency mode, which basically just bypasses anything that could potentially give you latency. Dig it. Okay, it's cool. Awesome. It's just Good a little tip. button. Good it's tip. great. So if, yeah, if pe- people are logic users, it's not in the stock thing. You have to enable it. So you just right click the thing and I think Turn I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to dedicate um, an interface to just Logic in the studio so that I can use it yeah. as a as a sound source. It's great. And I use the same, by the way, I use the same interface for both. They all just run off of my, my Orion. 32. Oh, right. Because you're doing, because it's a um, core audio interface. Mm-hmm. And so you can just use, they both They both can share the same inputs and outputs simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wow, wild. That's incredible. It's really bizarre. I don't know how this works and I, I hope the jig isn't up at some point, <laughs> but right now, if I never update my no, OS- Don't update. I'm still on Sierra or whatever. Like I'm sticking with it until it breaks. So, um, but that's a really good tool. Again, just whatever you have at your fingertips. If, you, if all you have is an old keyboard from when you were a baby- just use it. Just figure it out. I wish know? I did. I wish yeah, I still, of course. Now they they're cool again. keyboards when I was a baby. Though. Now they're cool again. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you have old Casios and stuff, like I, all that stuff is all over the records that I like to make. All right. So let's talk about, um, I think it was the Rustin Kelly track really quickly. Okay. It's one. Uh, so listening through your playlist, which Ryan and Rockstars, uh, look in the show notes for that. You can just click through and, and get to the video playlist and listen to all this stuff. Um, it's very clear that you are doing production in the computer. There's stuff that is happening with program drums and stuff. You really understand that. But then I think it was on the Rust and Kelly where I'm listening and I'm like, oh shit, this really sounds like live drums, but it, I think it's like program too, or it's a combination. And I wondered how, if you wanted to talk about how you go from the programmed drums where it's like, this is meant to be programmed versus I'm I'm using the benefits of programming, but I'm making it feel more like a live band in a studio kind of thing. Sure. Uh, on the Rustin Kelly record, actually, there is no programming at all. It's just Impressive. It's just processing, um, and that was, you know, the I'm not sure what th- elements in there that made it feel programmed, but I I, th- I think well, I like, can imagine that kind of kick and snare kick and were snare. very consistent, and hi hat was very in control, and absolutely like isolated or something. So yeah. kick and snare, uh, the fundamental of the kick and snare sound on the entire record comes from our crotch mic, our dirt crotch mic, which was a, a Electro Voice six thirty five. Um, one of those old, you know, cheap yeah, dynamic, yeah right? the dynamic mic. And it just, we gaff taped it to the kick drum. So it gave it, 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 because of the proximity effect, gave it a really nice sort of fake plosive thing happening. And is it, is it like on top of the wood shell of the kick drum next to the snare or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it's, I would, I think we put it on a towel just for rattle sake. We didn't want it to rattle. And then we just gaff taped the whole thing. Uh, Charles um, Godfrey at Sonic Ranch in El Paso, who was our engineer for the foundations of Dying Star. That was his, uh, he gets all the credit for that. That was his thing where he said, you might use this, you might not, but yeah. I want to record it. And then later you're like, thank God we have I'm that. so happy because that is how the kick and snare, because 
I think he went into a distressor or, or a level or, or something like yeah. that to make it all consistent. And to be honest, when I was doing rough mixes, desk mixes before it got to Andrew Sheps, um, I was using that more often. I, I kept lowering the kick mics and the snare mics and raising that thing. And, um, I don't know how much he used, but it doesn't sound too far off. The balance doesn't sound too far off from what we Yeah, like intended. he took his cues from his... Well, I mean, I've watched him do uh, videos where he shows how he might do a mix, and right. he seemed to express... And he's also been on the show, so oh, you, awesome. you guys are now podcast mates as Amazing. well. Amazing. He is the best. I mean, he yeah, is he's one awesome. of the best there is I think it's time to, to ask Andrew to come back on the show, too. Absolutely. But, but Andrew seems to have a real respect for... Um, where the record is coming from when it arrives at oh, him yeah. to mix. So like, it's like, if there's a balance going on, if there's plugins, even um, keep, keep it there. Mm -hmm. let, let me, let me pick up from that point and see where I can take it. Almost like, you know, it'd be, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of like a mastering guy, not saying, Hey, can you undo the entire mix that you just did right. before I master it? You know, yeah, just give it to me be like, as is, give me the mix that you mm -hmm. did and let me, let me take it to the next step. Definitely. And that's something that that's, uh, that's one of the reasons we decided to pursue Andrew is because we liked his, uh, black box technique. We just yeah. said, you know, that this record was really interesting because I had updated pro tools right in the middle <laughs> of the record. And all of my plugins disappeared. I don't know how it happened. And I didn't have the time to go and buy updates. I didn't have the money to go buy updates or whatever. But for some reason, I had a really old version of Pro Tools I was using forever. Two and a half year record. That's one of the risks. Yeah. And then everything became AAX from whatever it was oh, yeah. before. You went, to your, um, you, you went from 10 to 11 probably. It was 10 like to that. 11 or 10 to 12 or whatever it was. And I panicked. And so I mixed... Uh, the, what I sent to Sheps, I mixed with no plugins. The only plugins that I did have on there was a stock D-verb on mm -hmm. his vocal. And um, I had, for some reason, I had bought um, fair, fairly recently um, the Greg Wells mix. Uh, mix the one knob. Or one knob, knob yeah. mix centric. Yeah. Um, which he had told me about like at a dinner, like kind of in that period. So I had gone home and bought it and somehow that one worked. So on my mix bus, which all my stuff didn't work. So on my mix bus that I sent to him was Greg Wells's mix centric and a D verb that was just on Rustin's, you know, on his vocal. And that was it. And there was no processing on anything else. Um, no shaping, no compression. And we just couldn't figure out why we liked it so much. We're like, this has no processing at all. It's just raw. And when we sent it to him, um, to Andrew Sheps, I, I called him and he said, I said, look, I, I explained it sort of like tail between my legs. Like you're going to get this. And I was embarrassed. And I was like, you're going to get this. It's going to look like we didn't do anything. And I, you know, I know that you are like the, the king of, of mixing and I'm sorry. And he, and he just said, he said, no, but that's what it sounds like. And I have no interest in going in and making it sound any different. Right. I just want to make it come alive and make it three-dimensional. But I have no interest in trying to do something different than you than you did. Yeah. So that record, again, I don't I haven't seen his session of it, but from what I can understand, it's it's fairly minimal processing on that, aside from yeah. his iconic, you yeah, know, it just makes a lot and, of really good good choices totally. and stuff. Yeah. Um and then of course I just I just had um uh, Steve Shady was on the podcast and he had a great quote where he was talking about like the, the spirit of engineering um, or mixing where you're like, look, I, I'm just here to serve the art and the artists and, and um, Steve Albini too, mm -hmm. uh, talking about these, but he, but he, his quote was like, I don't have a horse in this race. Right. You know, which right. is such a great, it's great an amazing concept. quote. Absolutely. You know, it's yeah. like, this is, this is, I'm not, I'm not putting a horse in your race. Like this is your race and I'm just here to help you win it. You yeah. Know? And I have such a, I have such a deep admiration for mixers who feel that way. Yeah. Because it's not my job as a producer to come in and tweak the artist's sound. It's my job to help them extract it and be a funnel for them to just throw a million ideas in, and I can help them organize those thoughts and maybe bring some, you know, maybe bring some some fresh input. 
Um, but I try to stay as transparent as possible when it comes to records like Dying Star, um, because that's really that's Rustin's name. It's his. That's his record. So anything that I contributed to that to to him getting the sound that he wanted to me is a win. Yeah. And so if I send that to a mixer who and we know that there's a lot of them, and I won't throw anyone under the bus, but we know there's a lot of mixers who really are passionate about what they do. Uh, we would not have gotten the result we want. And I just, it's been really challenging to be honest. Maybe people can comment. Maybe you could tell me of some other mixers who are also transparent and whose main goal, it's really hard to find though. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. I guess you just have to sort of explore. For me, I like to go through the process of just listening to records. And if I like the sound of the record, find out who mixed it. And mm -hmm. that's usually a good, good cue right definitely, there. Definitely. Definitely. And because you, you might discover that you love the sound of a record and it turns out to be a record a mixer that has, that completely puts their stamp on the sound. Yes, absolutely. You know? um, but you know, yeah, everybody's, everybody's an individual. And so that's, that's a big part of the process. Definitely. Um, so then let's look at some other records okay. too. So, so um, on, let's see, pretty sister. Mm -hmm. And then was that the one I was thinking of that was, yeah, yeah. So pretty sister, uh, my notes are sounds awesome. Exclamation point. <laughs> Tell us about that project and how do you get such an in-your-face dance production? And Rockstar's this track, which is in the playlist, sounds like, to me, like a cross between Justin Timberlake and the Gap Band. It's fucking <laughs> awesome. And I, and I don't remember what song is in that playlist um, from Pretty Sister. You know, I didn't write that okay. down. I think I just wrote down Pretty Sister. Okay, cool. No, that's fine. Um, that whole project that whole project stemmed from um, an artist named Zach Waters who – was in a band, like an alt-rock band, and went solo around the time that he and I started making music together. So that was really a generation. It, it was really us generating something that we wanted to feel really fresh. And this was, you know, this was before Bruno Mars. This was before the movement of like new dance, you know, uh, that, that, that sort of movement that's now happening in the weekend and all those kind of sounds. Yeah. This was before all that. So we were kind of, it was uncharted territory to kind of bring that seventies funk thing into the modern era for us. It was, so it, it was a lot of experimentation and, uh, Zach is also a phenomenal producer and produces for a ton of artists as well, but also has an artist project. So that was a project that he and I really just exercise. We just go to the gym, basically. That's what we, you know, we just think of it like going to the gym every That's day. That's great, man. You're just exercising and just trying to, you're just trying to beat what you did the day before. You're looking for your sa a sound. You're looking for We're your looking sound. for a new sound. And that's, that took years to figure out. And we had so many influences that it wasn't just dance music. It was, it was stuff that, you know, he and I have very, very different tastes so I would take the kind of rock stuff that I was into and the alternative stuff I was into, and he would take the soul stuff and the R&B stuff that he was into, and we kind of merge them together and try to make something that was really in your face. And that came down to, um, it really came down to kick and snare choices. That was big. Yeah. That, and that's what I want to ask you is like, what are some sources that you would look towards to find kick and snare sounds that would work? And, and, Bass was another big one, the synth bass stuff. And synth really bass as well. And a lot of the bass, a lot of the bass was bass that, you know, I would play in uh, and then just kind of nudge onto the grid because it's so, it's got to be such a tight sound. So a lot of the, a lot of the bass, I'd say half, about half of the bass on the Zach Waters and some of the Pretty Sister stuff that we've done together is either myself playing bass or, excuse me, or, or synth bass on the other side of it. And that came from the movement of the synth bass came from a joke. It came from us kind of messing around and there being a track with no bass and me sitting at the piano and doing like a really intricate, almost like a bass lead that would go like, boom, bam, 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 like a, like a, like a bass solo. Yeah. And we'd listen back and I would do a couple passes and then we go, Okay, simplify that, simplify that, but leave the other runs, like leave those other little noodles in there. And that's what gives the movement of the 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 relationship between the the kick drum and and the synth bass is sometimes the kick is playing really standard four on the floor, sometimes it's playing more of a 
you know, punchy new Jack beat or whatever. Right. Um, What's a new Jack beat? Like a, like new Jack swing, you know, like, uh, it's really swung kind of like, a poison or, or, or one of those kind of songs like that, 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 you know, right. that kind of beat, right. um, swung tambourine. Um, so that kind of stuff we were, were just fascinated by. And we were just trying to find the appropriate relationship between kick and, and bass and then snares. We we're just obsessed with deep snares forever and ever. Um, it's just always been something. And I, tr- I, I try to use that on, on that same love on anything on Rustin's record as well is, is got a really nice deep bass kind of, you know, chesty uh, um, um, snare drum sound. Uh, whatever I'm doing, I just really, I'm really just attracted to that sound. Yeah. And so w- what would be some sources as far as where would you find your sounds? Where, 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 where exciting play? Do you already just have a whole library of kicks and snares? Just over, or do you generate yeah. them with certain like, you know, um, software drum machine sounds, or do you, do you import them in from places? They can come. I've, I've, I have a sample library that I've been building for years and years and they come from all sorts of places. Sometimes they come from like a vinyl rip of a kick and snare or a hi-hat. That you might've done yourself. That I would have done myself. Sometimes they come from vinyl rips that other people did. Sometimes they came from, uh, like I use audio hijack a lot, which is a software. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, that's basically well, what, yeah, 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 so, no, sorry. Go ahead and say, say what it is. Uh, audio hijack is, is, uh, a piece of software you can download on the Mac. I don't know if it's available for windows, but on Mac and, and it basically just turns your system audio. It, it records your system audio into, yeah, you can route yeah. anything to anywhere. Kind right. of, as long as so if I'm, if I'm on watching a video on YouTube or listening to a song on a streaming platform like Spotify or whatever, and I go, oh, I love that kick drum sound. I just open up audio, audio hijack and just hit record for a second and grab it. And then I'll take it in and I'll filter it and I'll mess with it. Sometimes I just keep it the same or use it as a layer. Um, but this is not legal. Advice, oh yeah, this Rock is not, this, this is, is not very legal illegal. advice. <laughs> um, but this is just for play. Just this is all just for play. Uh, but I use that stuff all the time. I mean, I, I like for, for programmed music, and and again, a lot of those samples that I'm grabbing are samples from other records too. So if it's from a hip hop record, they're taking those drum that 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 drum sound has been, um, you know, shared with for you know over the course of ten records and just got degraded and and re-EQ'd and recompressed and all those things over time. And I'm just the next step at it. And if someone wants to go and grab that sound. Yeah, they can do that. It should be. It should be like a chord progression, right? It's it's borrowed and handed down. It's borrowed, and, yeah, and, uh, and inspired. I would say I would say ninety percent of the time I'm tweaking, I'm pitching that sound, or recompressing it or uncompressing it with something like Transient Designer, which I do a lot. I I use that a lot yeah. um, to manipulate transients and stuff like that. If I want a tighter, if I love the kick sound, but it's just a little too big, transit designer always turn the sustain down or shave a little bit of that knockoff with the attack. So I'm, I'm usually adjusting it and then eventually it becomes a layer and there's a couple different layers happening. Well, so Um, um, let's talk about a couple of things. Well, let's talk about the layer thing for a sec. Where is it a layer? What, what is that within a plugin that includes layers? Is that layers of tracks and you're, you're manually placing things on the grid. It's, it's, it's for me, layering is usually done out on the, on the playing field, out in the grid. So it's, if I'm, if I'm doing like, like, um, Elohim, for example, um, most, I would say most all of the drums, um, on that, on those songs were programmed drums. That would be, I'd start with a little, uh, maybe a small kick that I love the attack, like a Lin kick or, some kind of drum machine thing that I just really like the punch of. Right. That's often, I agree. I think that's where you start. You use, let's get the punch. So you hear the the rhythm, mm-hmm. but then pretty soon into the production, you're like, Ooh, that this doesn't really actually have much low end going on. We need to add more yeah. girth to the, the bottom of this record. Right. It's, it's very easy to, it's very easy to start tailoring your production around your drum sounds. And we're not talking about uh, 808 trap beats here. We're no, talking no, no. about pop, you know, punchy dance beats. Right? Definitely. Yeah. Um, but I, I found that it was really easy to get caught up in the decade of the drum sound. 
And that can be cool, but that can also be detrimental because ultimately it's nice to make nostalgic songs and it's nice to make, you know, to, to make retro sounding music. But there's a reason we have new decades, <laughs> uh, but it's 2019. Like let's, you know, let's make something fresh and, and just be influenced by those decades. Yeah. And it doesn't have to sound exactly like that. So if I start with the Lindrum immediately, I'm going to, my production is going to start going there. Cause that's what will play, play nice with those sounds. So once I get a couple elements on, usually I start going, let me either swap the kick or add a sub layer and then I'll add a sub layer and go, okay, well, that's really nice. Maybe I'll mute the Lin now and add a different layer. So now there's, you know, three or four kick drums that are stacked on top of each other. And because it's MIDI, uh, when it starts out, it's MIDI. When I'm just like futzing around, it's all MIDI. And then I print them down and then I can chop them up. Um, right. So so you start out with the MIDI beat mm -hmm. and it's programming. Um, what, what would be a plugin you might use to play back that sample? Um, if I'm programming in logic, which is, that's where I normally I'm doing that. I use the EXS 24, which is their built in stock sampler. Okay. It's fantastic. You can make your own sample libraries. You can sh tweak the sound. You can pitch things down. Um, and so like each track you might, you might pull up a track with that EX 24. Mm -hmm. right? EXS 24. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, that sampler is only holding one of those kick sounds right now. Exactly. And you're just adding that and then. And then until, I do a new until track. You have four tracks of those mm -hmm. until you're like, that's pretty good. Now let's commit these. And then do you just select the tracks in logic and just say commit? Yeah. Like I just, that? or, or if it's, or if it's more of a pop song and I know I'm going to fly the kicks around, I'll just bounce like a little four bar loop or, or if it's the same kick over and over again, I'll just do like four kicks. Cause. Will you commit the four drums together? Or will you put them on four separate tracks? So I'll put them keep, on keep four, mixing later. I can keep mixing, and then eventually, you know, the, all those kicks will always get bust into one anyhow. So yeah. I can shift the balance, but I'm a big fan of bussing, and I I like to branch out my bussing when it comes to mixing and when it comes to recording too. It's sometimes easier for me to go, and all my kick data is going to go through one, you know, one kick bus. Right, and that's going to feed the drum bus, and that drum bus is going to feed. And right in into Logic, the mix can't bus. you make a folder track or something like that? And you can that make folders kind of, now in Logic, which so you is, only see the one track, which is amazing. Yes, and you just see the spikes, like the transients or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's twirl downs in Logic now. I mean, twirl again, twirl downs. Yeah, you know the little things. I don't know what they no, call. I don't know that one yet. The little arrow, and it opens up that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, you're right, right. Yeah, okay. I'm calling like it a twirl down. I, I don't like know that. Why. It's better. So yeah, all that kind of stuff is great. Well, I mean, you did start out with Fruity Loops after I did, all, so, so I don't know. I started out with, with Audacity, so there was no room for any of this stuff. Yeah, you switched DAWs, but you kept the Fruity language. I what, did, what exactly. <laughs> Twirl downs. Um, so yeah, a lot of times my, you know, my drums will be, usually program drums, kicks, snares, and hi-hats will be stacked. Um, unless I just happen to find the best snare sample So you might have more time. than one hi-hat. Oh yeah. A hi -hat. Yeah. Cause I like dimension with hi hats. So yeah. if again, these days I'm not doing a whole lot of pop stuff anymore, but on the occasion, uh, I love the sound of a live hat. So I'll track a live hat just with one, you know, condenser mic, just track it and then get that to where it's sitting nice and humanizes those drums a little bit. And then add a digital layer to that and pan it to the other side. And then maybe add more of a ticky, like, a like a, 808 or a 909 hi-hat on the other side, really low, just to kind of keep everything pushing into the grid, but leaving the loose hi-hats for the natural rhythm. So Yeah, it, I always it, wondered about that. Like I'd listened to um, so many programmed stuff and it's like clear that the kick and the snare are programmed and probably on the grid or something, but, mm -hmm. but it never felt like when I would just quantize everything. And right. I was like, I, I think they're... I think the subdivision stuff is more live and, oh, and yeah. loose and swung and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's things, there are things, you know, if I'm doing something more of, of like an urban, like a hip hop track or something, a lot of times I'll just quantize the kicks and leave the snare and the hi-hats, everything looser. Um, and that's something that just from listening to like Dilla and Madlib, like that universe of things. Yeah. Who know? I mean, I think you can go online and watch videos of them making beats and all that stuff, which is really fun to do. But you have to ultimately find the thing that works for you. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. that's those are just some deep pockets. Like it's it's hard to do that and then not quantize it. But you just figure out what works for you. Maybe you need to quantize it every other one, or maybe not at all. Or 
you know, or do it super rigid. Yeah. So because there's so many different grooves too, you know, and each absolutely. one's got a different requirement. Yeah. Um, quantizing is remarkable. It's also a massive headache sometimes. And, and um, it sucks you just have tools. to learn the little bits. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like, you know, and then, and then when you start talking about things like beat detectiving live drums, mm -hmm. you could be like, man, I love the, I love how it just goes a hundred percent on some of these things. But then the fill comes along and it's like, oh, I have to have completely switch to a triplet feel for the fill to make sense now yeah. and, and everything. And it, all of a sudden it takes your live drums and makes them sound crazy and you're like, your head hurts. And you're like, oh, I you just do this one step at a time. I think you just have to be willing to go there. You have to be willing to take time. It, a lot of that stuff takes a lot of time. I was watching, um, I love these, this new series that Eric Valentine's doing. Have you been watching these that he's posting? I haven't on, been watching it yet. But on YouTube. It's great. Uh, he's just basically like, you know, exploding songs open. And sometimes he's doing it with the people that he's, that um, like the band or the artist that he worked with or someone that was there at the time. But he did one recently about um, loops and how you can get live drums and loops to line up and not, uh, and not cancel each other out phase wise. Right. And it was a fully backwards way of thinking for me that I had, I, because when I do, if I'm, I rarely do live drums for a project like that and use, um, drum samples under them. It's just not, it's just not something that I do that often. Um, if it really needs it, if for some reason the snare top mic is buzzing or like, I can't salvage it. Sure. But for the most part, it's always going to be the live drums and I'll just try to EQ it and gate it and do whatever I can to get them to feel present and in your face. Yeah. Um, but Eric Valentine was showing this process. I think he is this is his latest video about how he uses Beat Detective to generate a tempo map. And then his grid shifts to his drums now. So the grid is uneven because the drummer is playing like a drummer like would. A, like it's a, not, drums, so the drums yeah. actually aren't quantized. The grid gets quantized to the yeah, drums. Yeah. And then the loop gets quantized to that. So it's really, again, it's, it's, that's what works for him. That's a really backwards way of thinking about it. And I love that he's doing that. I think that that's amazing. And I'm so excited to go and experiment with that too. But there is no wrong way to do any of this stuff. I just, you just have to. I just kept sometimes. failing, and every time you fail, like hopefully you learn from your mistake. And so, if you just keep failing, hopefully some knowledge comes out of that. Yeah, because you know? what happens is you stumble on one that works and sounds great, and if you're paying attention, you remember how you got there. Absolutely. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. So let's talk a little bit more about samples and sample libraries. Okay. Um, talk about, you know, so it's very clear that that you have all these sounds now because you've been doing it for years mm -hmm. and you've been collecting them and yeah. keeping them organized. Now, how do you, like, what's part of your process of keeping things organized? How do you still have samples today that you found years ago and you know where to find them and you haven't lost them and... They have you haven't lost them on a crashed hard drive, right? You know, geeky stuff like that. Backups are great. I use um, on my laptop. I have a hard drive that's for my sessions. That's outside. It's an external hard drive, and then I have another hard drive that's for my samples. So I keep them separate. And if I get you know once a year or so, I'll just back up my sample library to another hard drive, and I keep it in a drawer. And I do the same to my project drive, and. How big does a sample library drive? If if we're going to be like, okay, we, we want to get serious about this or we want to be 
more capable. How much drive should we dedicate towards growing our sample library from zero or whatever? I personally think as big as you can, because samples can just, once you get into it, you're going to start finding somehow the universe is going to open up its doors and samples are going to start coming in. So I've, I got one of those Lacy rugged drives. I think it's four terabytes or something. And I just bought two of them because they're like a couple hundred bucks. And yeah, it's a bit of an investment, but you go, if you buy a hard drive, always buy a second hard drive. Just do it. There's no purpose of having a hard drive without a backup. It's just if it dies, that's it. That's the end of it. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> definitely backing things up. We we definitely preach that here. Good. Yeah. So back it up. And of course, it's hard to keep, it's hard to stay religious about it, but you just got to do it. Um, use software like Carbon Cloner or whatever you use. And the sample library organization is is kind of the taste. The way I do it is I've got my first, my first, um, what would you call it? Like my first hierarchy of folders. Mm-hmm. When you first open the hard drive, it has my samples and then samples that I've downloaded off of, off of from sample packs. Uh, or Those would packs be two that different. Big, yeah. So they'd be like categories. my stuff that I've either made or, or ripped or the sounds that I know and I label them and I, I edit them in mm-hmm. Pro Tools and make sure that they're all good and they're trimmed up and they're, you know, super low file size because that can bog your system down. Um, and then it'll be a list and I'll have, cause I, I share sample libraries with friends too. So I'll have, you know, Zach sample library and he has mine or I have my other friend, John sample library down there and a bunch of different people who have done the same thing that I have. And I just kind of go down the list and I, I know now that if I need to go and find a super dancey thing, I know kind of the direction to head and then it just keeps going and it just fans out. And of course I have favorites. And then when I really have a good set where I go, okay, I've got a folder now where I know I've got 10 great kicks and 10 great snares and for, but would you think about them in terms of the genre? That absolutely. Those 10 are absolutely. So for? they just, everything gets broken down like that in genre. So it'll be like, you know, French house. And I know what that sounds like. Right. I know that the, I know that those snare drums have a, all of them have a clap, like an 808 clap or some kind of clap that's. I've nudged before the snare because that's what that French snare drum sounds like. It's like a kada, it's like a flam. So I know that if I'm looking for that sound or if I'm looking for a nice punchy round kick drum, that's where I'm going first. Yeah. But if I'm going, you know, I want something more uh, kind of like indie vibes. Like I know I'm going to go to my drum machines area and I know that I've just gleaned a bunch of stuff from there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of crappy sounds and I would say the majority of every sample library is really crappy sounds. Right. But then there's some that are amazing and just like right click it. And I, I do a color, you know, if I love it, I just do like, you know, you can let, you can color your files. Mm -hmm. So I just do like yellow. I know that if I'm scrolling through, it'll pop up somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, I I loved when uh, Mac used to let you color the, it was almost like a highlighter color on the Mm -hmm. whole name of the file. And then they switched it somewhere where now it's just a little color. It's just a dot, dot now. It's, like, it's kind of a bummer. Come on, dudes. I know. I know. But that's how I keep mine organized. And to be honest, it's it's not super organized, but it's, but it's that's organized kind of all enough. That's ta- all it takes. And then when me. you're in Logic and you're using, using EX24, mm-hmm. um, does that have its own browser thing where, where you just direct it to that drive and now it sees it shows you? It Your doesn't organized folders. It do you doesn't just drag as nice. It, yes, it doesn't. It doesn't do it as nice as um, some other plugins do. Um, like um, Native Instruments has their own um, contact libraries, stuff like right, that, right. which are great. It's a little out of my wheelhouse, so I've done a couple of drum kits in there. But I really just like the EXS. It's really easy, and you just open up like a you just open up like a piano roll and you load in like a folder and it just get, loads all your samples into that folder and it distributes it to the keys Ooh, so you would just drag and drop from the drive mm-hmm. onto there and it just yeah puts the spreads them out that fans them makes out. it e- quick and easy now you just grab your keyboard and start playing and exactly look for the sound. You're like yeah that's fun and I some like sounds you want as like a one shot and some of them you want to loop or some of them you want to be mono and some you want to be able to play together. You know, yeah. if I, if uh, again, if I'm doing, if I'm going to play stuff in and I find two snares in a EXS that I like together, I'll play them together. I'll just, you know, hit the like kick and snares and I'll hit two or three fingers on the keyboard as my snare drum. Yeah. So 
I want to make sure that those can all play as a legato instrument, as yeah. a 16 voice or whatever. So, well, I think the good tip there that. too is like rock stars, if you're not sure what platform you're going to be using to play your sampler from, you know, maybe it's going to be Logic, maybe it's going to be a plugin inside Pro Tools, maybe you're on Studio One, maybe you're, you know, using something else. Um, the, the, the good takeaway for me is like, any one of those, you still start with a hard drive with your own personal organization of yeah. how you want to keep these files organized. Don't let don't let the apps force your hand, you know, right. as far as where this stuff lives. Because it'll, you know, most apps just like create some folder in a documents folder and you don't even know where the stuff is. Yeah. And then, you know, you go do another session later, you upgrade your computer and you're like, what happened to all my sounds? So yeah. that's, that's a really good strategy. I like that. Um, cool, man. Cool. Yeah. And you get sounds from anywhere. I mean, I, I oftentimes am looking for a thing and I'm too lazy to go sift through my sample library. So I pull up my iPhone on DM1 and my little drum machine app and plug an aux cord into the headphone thing. And those are my drum sounds. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that you use these sounds too. So when it comes to synth sounds, mm -hmm. do you also create preset folders in that same drive and save all your, your synths there as well? Definitely. Every time I have a synth that I spend a little time on, you know, presets are awesome, but, and you're just, just trying to find an inspiration. Right. But if you've got an image, like a vision in your head for how this thing should sound, yeah. and you start with that initial patch on whatever soft synth you're using, and you kind of dial it in and it's great, I always just, if I'm in Logic, I just save the whole channel strip. Because a lot of times that sound has maybe some spatial plugins on it or right. some compression or EQ. So I want that whole thing. So I just do uh, right there on the channel strip, save channel strip, and I've got a little folder. It's got all my, you know, leads or paths or whatever. Right, right. Um, and then you might also make a folder that's like the artist name and the song name if you want to keep that You together. could totally do that. I've never done that. that in the but, session folder maybe possibly. Yeah, right? I've never done it that way, but that's a really cool way to do it too. Yeah. If you go, I remember the thing I did on that one record. Let me find that. Um, yeah. For me, I just, and they're all weird names. Nothing, you know, the naming convention. No one could find it if they were on my computer. But for right. me, I know what it means. Right, right. Okay, so just cool, name man. everything. Yeah. Cool. So now, uh, like, I think it was on Elohim, mm -hmm. um, Half Love, that song. So like a perfect dance pop song in production. I mean, it's thank like you. I'm listening to it. I'm like, this is like, this is exactly right sounding to me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How do you think of a song arrangement like that differently from others? Like when you're working with somebody like Rustin Kelly and um. What goes into uh, what goes into an arrangement like that? Well, that that song was generated. Uh, if I if I'm remembering this correctly, that Half Love was started in Nashville. Um, Elle came out from L.A. She flew over here, and we we've known each other for a long time, so we have great rhythm in the studio. And it was one of those days that we didn't really know what was going to happen, and we decided, well, let's. Let's make a really fun song today. Usually, you know, a lot of times we start making kind of heady stuff. We're like, well, let's just let's just do a fun one today. Let's just do something that you could dance to no matter where you were. So that started with um, keys and melodies. And then I don't know how that lyric even came about, but it just, someone shouted it out in the room. It was just the two of us. And we just rolled with it. And then over that day, uh, we just kind of sat next to each other and kind of took turns on the keyboard. And she's an unbelievable classically trained pianist. So she can play all that stuff way better than I can. And so she'll just say like, Oh, I really, what about this kind of thing? I'll say, Oh, I really like that little part of it. So I'll take that. And now that's this thing. And that song went on a total journey because that, so we did, we started that in Nashville. Then she went home. We did a couple other songs as well in that period of time. And she went home. And then um, I kind of worked on it a little bit and and made sure that the drums were hitting. And, you know, kick and snare, so important to me. That is like, that is what I spend most of my time on. Yeah, especially on a production like that, you know. Absolutely. It's just got to hit you in the face. And, but she's the type of artist who will take home and wants to think about it. Some some artists are like, I love it as is. I've got a bunch of notes, like mixed notes. Um, but she's the type of artist who will go home and really want to make take whatever she's doing in a collaborative sense and really make it her own, which I love. I think that's awesome. So she went home and, and opened it up on her own and 
muted like all the verse music and just wanted the vocal to be with this just one weird sound. And right. Yeah. It's like, it's like a freaky little keyboard. Totally, right? totally spooky. And, and, um, so that just went through all these different motions with us sending things back and forth and then her really honing in. And then, uh, and then she sent me what she felt was the final version. And I was like, this is unbelievable. It's even better than it's better how we started it. Yeah. You know, I think you have to take ego out of the equation when you're making anything. Um, like you got to write it and then you got to cover it. And mm-hmm. then you got to um, be somebody who was hired to edit it. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. Just always. And that's, that's always been. Approach it with a I, big eraser. Yeah. Just be, yeah, exactly. Just be okay with losing stuff. Yeah. You know, if the verse is great and is and is killing it, but the chorus is kind of flat, and you're trying to embellish the chorus to make it better with a bunch of production, maybe just write a better chorus. Just try it and try to beat it. And we always do that. Elle and I always try to beat, even if we love it and we call each other and sing it over the phone. I'm obsessed with this song. I love this. I've been singing it for months. And then I'll say, but maybe it's not as good. Or she'll say, you know, I worked on another verse. And I think it's better. I don't know. And then we'll have this time period where we'll go, I don't know. Is it better or is it different? And then we'll just pick one and go, yes, that hits better. It tells the story better. The melody is way more interesting. It's okay to just be flexible and, and not stick to the song once it's written. Now, when you're making these major changes to songs, how do you keep organized so that you can stumble on the fact that two months ago, it actually sounded better than where it is now? Save as always. I'm I'm a I'm always saving as in my sessions. Yeah. So if I have and and I I bounce a lot of files. I bounce a lot and you just keep just keep all those bounces in the bounce folder. Just and, keep them all in the bounce folder, both in Logic and Pro Tools. Um, and now now I'll do them by date. Everyone has a different naming system, and they're all valid. I don't know why I'm in like a date thing now. So now I'm just do the name of the song and the date and what version. If it's just the date, I know that I only bounced one version that day. If we did five bounces that day, I've got like the date and then version one, two, three, or ABC or whatever it is. Um, Because for me, it's easier than trying to remember what, what version was it that we did that thing on that was in the session, but was muted. So you couldn't even reference it from the bounce. Right. So I go, Oh, we did. That was the one we did on Tuesday. Oh, okay, right. great. Now I can go to the date for me. That helps. Yeah. Um, I, I try and let the bounce name match the session name so that I know which session to open up to. Exactly. Yeah. Every time I, and I have a print track at the bottom of my, my session. So Every time I do a save as, I change the file name there and I change it in, in so on my print. So you print it back into the session. Yeah, I print yeah. it back into the session. Yeah. Old school. The, yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's easier for me, especially on a laptop. Sometimes things stop and I can just pick up where I left off and just consolidate the track. Right. Um, you know, sometimes things are just hanging up. So it's just easier for me to see. And I always, always use the waveform and, and I like to kind of analyze and make sure that I'm getting... Uh, from a mixing standpoint, like really nice, uh, what do they call it? Kind of like the crest. You oh, know, you the like cre- to see the waveform. I there. like to ah, see it. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, you, it's like a visual cue to help you know that this looks like what you're used to seeing a mix look like. Absolutely. Yeah, reference mixes are great. It's 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 nice to know that no matter how long you're sitting in front of the desk and to sit in front of a mix, that it might just not be that good yet. Oh, I know that all the time. <laughs> I think I know we that all, all know that. It's but just... it's one of the benefits about getting away from stuff because you come back with that fresh perspective. Oh, yeah. Sometimes the edit with a big eraser, there's no way it would be possible until you get away from the song long enough to come back and go like, hold on, hold yeah. on. Do, 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 mute all this stuff. What do I got? Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Why don't I just not yeah, use this here? Don't use it there. That kind of thing. You know. Absolutely. Otherwise- you 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 instinctively try to use it because you just worked hard on to create it. Right, right. Yeah, You're like I just made this thing. <laughs> Am I gonna kill my baby already? Yeah, you know. I also like to print. I like to print in in the DAW, like print back into the DAW because then I have I can see all of my previous versions right in there as a playlist. So right. if I need to A B something, right, good point. Yeah. I can you know hit on input input monitoring and listen to. It as it's playing and then turn it off as it's playing 
and hear the previous version or five yeah, and versions that makes back. it a sort of instantaneous for you to comp between the two different all the different mixes. Exactly. Ooh, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, man. which is really have fun. to readopt that strategy. It's great. It's great. And like things, you know, things don't need to. For me, I, you know, of course, everyone wants things to be really loud, but for me, I try not to put my final limiter on until the very end because yeah. I just wanted to. I I want to know what it's going to sound like when I'm take that aggressive limiter off of it and send it to, you know, send it to someone who's going to master it. Well, so. dude, um, we are arriving at the end of the podcast. Awesome. Let me jump in and I'm going to ask you um, three quick questions at the end here. Okay. Um, favorite hardware tool or something you're excited about right now? Uh, Warm Audio 1176. Dig Clown. it, man. Dig it. Love their stuff. And that 1176 is probably one of the best things they make. It's, it's unbelievable. It's the WA WA. I think it's just WA76, I 76, think it's, but yeah, it's the, yeah, it's so. the 76 clone. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I like those guys. I need to check it out and give it a listen to. Oh, it's awesome. Um, favorite software tool or something you're excited about right now? Hmm. I really like, um, Infected Mushrooms plugin manipulator. I've been really into that lately. Now, I thought Infected Mushroom was a plugin in Waves. Is so it? Infected Mushroom is the name of a DJ group um, that happened to also make plugins. So they um, they make several plugins, and um, one of them is Manipulator. Manipulator. And it is okay, an cool. awesome vocoder if anyone's interested in that universe an amazing, amazing vocoder tool um, That's cool, that man. you can also sidechain to play in as a, you know, uh, harmonizer effect. If you're looking for that kind of sound, that's Bad really ass. Great. All right, yeah. cool. Um, so now this last question is hypothetical. Okay. We're going to take the way back studio machine. You're going to go back, find young JK. Okay. Not JKing right now. <laughs> um, young Jared. And you're going to say, listen, dude, I know you want to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Um, you got to put down the ducky to play the saxophone. No, if you what what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could to be a rock star of the studio one day? That was an Ernie from Ernie and Bert Sesame Street reference. There. Oh, deep. That was a deep cut. Um, that's a really good question. I think patience is the biggest thing I would tell myself. Is you're going to be really, really excited and eager and it's going to be really frustrating. And you're going to constantly ask yourself, why, why not me or why me, but just like, enjoy it. Just be patient and do the work because the things that you think are the best things ever when you finish them and you're just starting out probably aren't. And in hindsight, in eight years, you're going to look back and go like, wow, that was what I was really upset that nobody liked. <laughs> Just be okay with failing and picking yourself up and trying again and um, have fun. It's supposed to be fun. That's why we do music. It's supposed no, to be it's fun. Good advice, yeah. man. Keep it fun. Keep if it you fun. keep it fun, you'll never dread a day in the studio. Yeah. Just have fun. And if it's not going well, just change it. Awesome, man. Dude, thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. Let the Rockstars know how they can find you online. How do they reach out to you to make their next hit single? Um, my, uh, you can find me on social media. I'm not super active, but I am on there. Uh, my handle is jbam, J-B-A-M-N, on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to... And you got a website too, right? Yeah, it's just jaredk.com. Sweet. Man. Yeah. Easy. J-A-R-R-A-D. Yeah. K. Just the letter K. Com. We didn't even ask you what the K stands for. Don't tell us now. Okay. Unless you want to. I can't just my last name. Uh, it's just too complicated. <laughs> my last name is Kritstein. It stands for K as in K-O-O-L. That's right. K, yeah, cools. Uh, yeah, it stands for Kritstein. Uh, right there's the just four consonants in a row and no one knows how to spell that. So that's awesome. someone recommended that I get rid of the Ritstein and leave the K. That's cool, man. All right, dude. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. What an absolute pleasure. I look forward to coming over and checking out your studio. And you've inspired me to uh, to want to start having some DJ night parties here. And I'm gonna, you're the first person I'm going to call when I do. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Talk soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music.